Hello and good evening, friends. Welcome to this last talk of the ACNS webinars for the month of August. Today, we are blessed to have with us two distinguished personalities who are specialists in endoscopy and skull base surgery. The speaker for today is a very well-known and renowned neurosurgeon in the whole world. Through his position as the chairman of the WFNS Neuroanatomy Committee, he has significantly contributed towards the neurosurgical education of the residents and the young neurosurgeons around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please introduce you to Professor Imad Kannan, who is Professor and Chairman Emeritus, Department of Neuroscience, Al Faisal University College of Medicine, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Professor Kannan today will be talking about merits of simple and hybrid use of endoscopy in skull based surgery. To chair this session, we have with us Professor Alberto Felitti from Italy. Professor Felitti works at Department of Neurosurgery, Biomedicine and Movement Sciences, University of Verona, Italy. He is a specialist in neuroendoscopy who has published several articles regarding this subject. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yuko Kato, I welcome the speaker, Professor Imad Kannan and Professor Alberto Felitti to this online platform of ACNS webinars. As always, Professor Liu Boon Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. With that introduction, may I please request Professor Kannan to please start his webinar talk. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Vaja, and thanks to uh, my dear friend uh, Yoko Kato for the invitation. I'm happy that Alberto is with me, so he gave, gave me a hand on the endoscopy issues uh, as we were talking about the history of practice. So I'd like to have an overview of the trend in neurosurgery and the potential use of endoscopy and how I consider endoscopy in my practice. I'll share my screen. So the evolution of skull base will, cannot be conducted without the contribution of these people. We'll start from Cushing. We have the group that they progress in the uh, complex skull base surgeries and the uh, maximal exposure to maximal uh, bone taking, avoid balcony and uh, named here, Sami, uh, Mufti, Donans, just uh, Shaker, Kawazi, introduced several, uh, his own uh, approach. Taka Fukushima, I learned from him tremendously, Bernard George from France, Bob Spetzler, and the endoscopic team that they have uh, introduced uh, additional uh, armamentarium for the practice of modern neurosurgery. So uh, temporary practice evolved from the gross exposure to, uh, and the conventional exposure to the functional exposure. You don't need to see the whole brain to come to a small lesion. You are focusing where the lesion is or where the vital structure surrounding and you go there. And we have reversed again in the recent practice back to the simple approach. Uh, we have introduced the frontal orbital zygomatic as the uh, logging horse for the anterior uh, and middle uh, central skull base lesions and the far lateral approach for the foramina magnum and the combined approach, the pre uh, sigmoid approach combined with the subtemporal approach by Cuba approach, I call it. We reverted back to a more simple is the terrional approach and the uh, retoma sigmoid approach thanks to the endoscopy that supported us to maximize our exposure with the little exposure of bone. Uh, the hybrid microscopy endoscopy, this is my favorite topics that I'd like always to use uh, because I'm uh, grown up as a microsurgeon. I like to use the endoscope, but under microsurgical technique. Uh, we are fostered by the new uh, instrumentation, new endoscopy cameras, modern imaging facilities, and innovation in science and technology. Decision making about any lesion is the location, the size, direct of growth of that lesion, the pathology you are dealing with, vascular anatomy and venous drainage of that lesion, and patient is uh, presentation and comorbidity. You don't treat a lesion out of context of the patient condition. And this is an evolution for our start, the trend for the uh, pituitary lesion. So these are the contributors for uh, microsurgery and that by uh, Julius Hardy who introduced the microscope, adapted it from uh, the first endoscopic surgeon 
uh, Gio from France. He was the first who demonstrated endoscopic surgery with the setup he has. But added the most important part, I felt that Julius Hardy, other than the microscope, he coined the microadenoma, which was uh, with a conundrum to treat Cushing disease. And I adapted the practice that in the technical note, just very humble person, Professor Griffith from Bristol, he published in 1987 in a small technical note about the direct approach to the sphenoid sinus, which I use it in my practice on a regular basis. Of course, the endoscopy complemented the practice to the pituitary surgery and the group, the avant-garde group or the Pittsburgh group. And of course, there were several of them, Napoli group, Austrian group, and uh, the Brazilian group. Most of these groups, they were with their ENT hand in hand. And this is how they developed the endoscopy in their uh, technique. So the technique of uh, going transfer Italy, these are the important factors you have to adapt in your practice. You have to understand the anatomy of the sinus sinus and uh, CT scan is the ideal uh, test. When you build an experience, I can manage sometimes with the uh, MRI, but when it comes to complex cases, sometimes the CT is of great value. Our ENT, they like to have the CT, and I think most of the endoscopic surgeon as well. Vascular anatomy is important, not only the both cavitated artery and cavernous sinus, but you have to deal when you are doing the extended approach to be aware of the superior hypophysial uh, artery that supplies the chiasm. and you don't want to damage this one or the A1 and the perforated. Tumor configuration extension, you have to study it there. Now, in my practice, what I do, I like the hybrid approach. And I, for the pure pituitary uh, adenoma, and what I do, I take the, the Haddad flap, whether I'm going to use it or not, because at the end, I'm going to reach to the posterior part of the septum, and I need to take some of the septum de posterior aspects to give space for the endoscope from the contralateral, which I like to use the forehand technique. And that flap, if I'm in need, I will put it. If not, I will place it back on the septum. So th this is the uh, Haddad flap, the vascularized uh, flap, which was published uh, many years ago. The approach is to the sphenoid sinus. And this is, I like this picture with the, uh, scheme because we can go through the ostium and this is the landmark for most endoscopic surgeon dealing with the ENT colleague because this is a common approach they enter the sinus through the ostium one alarm remember the ostium open to the sinus but you don't know to which chamber so you have to open widely so you take any septi inside the sinus so you have a space and you don't depend on the sinus septums as a midline. Your midline is the uh, sphenoid crest. And that's why I like the midline to expose it early. And then I connect both ostium, which they are hiding behind the superior uh, turbinate. And I will make the facelift, not by plastic surgeon, but uh, by the neurosurgeons. So we take the anterior wall and then we are in the sinus. Navigation is of a great value. Nowadays, of course, people practice transferring the surgery in the past. The C arm was an essential part, now not anymore. Navigation, this is a fixed landmark in general, the cell at Torsica, and you can see it on navigation. And especially when you are dealing with a recurrent tumor or post radiation and you'd like to identify some of the confusing anatomy. This is of great value. Endoscopy, it gives you a near vision and a wide uh, spectrum, uh, wide view. A blind corner will be identified. This picture is from Petra. At this edge, you are looking away for the treasure building. And this is how you see it by the endoscope and near vision. Uh, so the, the this is very important. And this is how we uh, will do it with the endoscopy. I don't like to trim the turbinate. This is in the courtesy of uh, Professor Capabianca, 
publication to sports company. Uh, then we need, that's why I like the, com, uh, the hybrid approach. I squeeze the term benefit with the speculum shortly, then I take the speculum. These are like a sponge, they can be compressible, especially you are doing a pure pituitary, not the extended approach. And you see here the osteum hiding behind in front of the superior turbine. Once you identify this, then you go for the face lift of this sinus and you identify the structure that you might need during the surgery. In pituitary, I don't need, if it's a purely intracellular, like in Cushing disease, I don't need to expose the optic uh, uh, bulge or protrusion or the carotid bulge and just know where it is. And these septides, as I said, sometimes they go to the medial wall and you be careful when you take them out. I prefer to drill rather than to punch. This is a case where I use the hybrid technique. The way I'm doing it, I put a medium-sized speculum and displace the septum to the contralateral side, do a sub periosteal exposure of the face of the sinus, like what you see here. This is the nasal crest, the septum behind this speculum. Then at the lower corner from the contralateral side, I enter with the dissector, make a an incision of the mucosa on the other side, take some of the posterior septum, and then I introduce the endoscope. When I reach that stage, this takes me only two minutes after making the, uh, the hadad flap. And this uh, incision from the contralateral side is very fast. And then I do the rest under the endoscopy. And here you see the drill. I can drill from one ostium to the other, take it out remove the tumor and then I'd like to see that herniated diaphragm done, uh, especially when you have a macro adenoma. You see the advantage when you are finished, you push that diaphragm with the patty on the side, then you can identify the middle wall of the caverna sinus for any residual lesions in that uh, area. I don't have the experience tackling the caverna sinus under endoscopy myself. I've seen nice videos from people in, uh, over all the countries. Now the people, they train purely in endoscopy. They like to do that, they go off. Uh, I have a different concept. I will trace them if this is a functional uh, tumor and non-functional tumor, I don't trace them because I don't want to give the question of, of thalmoplegia or bleed in the cavernous and the carotid artery itself. And, uh, so the new indication now for the help of endoscopy, we move these were the indication for craniotomy. Now, most of them, they shifted to the endoscopic surgery because you can do most of this with the endoscope, whatever the size, as long as it's a midline, not creeping into the temporal fossa. And sometimes we still have some restriction for transferring the surgery at large is the, the kissing arteries that you might have uh, in some cases. This is the technique to take a macro. That's what I do. I use the clock technique, start from the lower part, then from the lateral part, keep the central and upper part to the end. This is where the money is because the A1, the hypophyseal artery, the vessels and the optic chasm are superiorly. So you'd like to initiate a dead space at the base and slowly then the tumor can come down uh, with their section. This is one example. This is an extensive tumor. We went with the hope that we'll take most of it, and we were lucky because with the 30 degree endoscope, after you resect the lower part, this start coming down. And I was guided. I want to see this hemorrhagic pituitary at the top, as you see it here. It tells me that I have reached to that area, and really, I reached that region. And it, actually, I'm not up, but it came down and it helped me to achieve a good resection like what you see on this picture, these uh, patent supercellular system. This is another case. I could not do it in one stage. I tried, I put the 30 degree, but there was vague area. I was not sure what I'm seeing at the top. There's some residual tumor, but I was worried about hypothalamic disturbance. And I said, 
let's take that part and take it in the second stage. And we took it in the second stage in one week time. And this is postal section because part of this tumor loosened up, came down to some extent. They don't come all the way down uh, as described in the literature. Uh, we acquired the intraoperative MRI. And the other day in my webinar, we were discussing the value of this one. And some people, they said, it's too much money for little value. I think this is where the indication is. If you are in doubt, you have it in, you do the MRI. This is one of the indication, uh, huge pituitary that you are not sure. Although the endoscopy 30 degree might give you a 45 degree some exposure, but there are some area you might need to see if there is residual left or not. Of course, the pure indication are the interaxial lesion where it's, uh, things change dynamically. You cannot depend on the navigation alone, but post puncture resection, you need to check your extent of resection with the MRI. These are the publication uh, of, from the Pittsburgh group on the giant pituitary tumors. And uh, you see their total resection was not that high, but it's still in the range of 70%. They might be a little bit in the recent publications. Visual improvement is clear. Visual worsening is not that much. We still hope that should be less. And uh, they need to reoperate in 12.7% of the cases. What are the factors that limit the degree of the restriction? It's not your technique. This is the disease itself is sometimes multilobular uh, configuration. They found it in their uh, statistic uh, with a high p-value and the extension to the middle fossa. It would be difficult. Some people, they like transcavernous to the middle fossa. I think it's too much. To, this is the ego, I think. Uh, people like novelty, innovation, and challenges. The human nature. We are all born with this nature. And we have to temper these to some extent and think there are alternative options for this thing. So these two indications, I feel you might do some uh, resection transmittally, but you might consider the craniotomy in these cases. These are the indications for craniotomy. And the complication rate in their series were apoplexy, that occurs. And I have one case in my practice before the time of uh, uh, the endoscopy we were in use and uh, interoperative MRI where the patient crash after the surgery, half an hour after. We get a CT scan and we show hemorrhagic of a residual tumor high up along the floor, floor of the lateral ventricle that we had to rush and uh, put an EVD and put in, uh, try to take this tumor, the carotid tumor from above. He did not do very well because I think the herniation due to acute hydrocephalus was the uh, burden on him. Uh, DI uh, problem, CSF leak, the rate was very high, 16, but they went down to seven. I think the rate now we can accept within 45% now they had that uh, muscular flap. These are studies uh, by Comata, that was an old study from 2012, but they are still valid. He has taken six studies of five, almost 500 patients. No doubt endoscopic cohort demonstrate that they have a higher rate of gross total resection than any other technique, whether it's uh, microsurgical or climate. Of course, comparison to cranotomy, this paper compared to cranotomy, nobody now compared to cranotomy because nobody goes into this discussion. We all get it for granted. Endoscopy is the right approach. Microscopic transferred cohort, lower rate of resection, and the visual outcome is not as good as in uh, endoscopy. Endoscopy gives you that near vision. A residual tumor next to the optic nerve can be retrieved and improve the status. And you see the vessels. And the same with the stroke of pituitary score. That's why the outcome, even in technology, uh, DI, having the endoscopy, you can see the stroke and dissect the tumor, not blinding from it. Uh, transcranial, as I said, is the poor. There is no good comparative study of the hybrid technique I'm using with the pure endoscopy. And this is where I feel it, 
uh, by the end, it's an endoscopic surgery for the stage two, three, four of the procedure. I stage the procedure, the nasal part, stage one. This part, I don't feel that we should affect the integrity of the nasal cavity. Uh, these are the study I mentioned about the DI and its better outcome with the endoscopy. Preservation of a gland becomes an essential part of your practice, especially if you are dealing with microadenoma and some macroadenoma. And the uh, reflection of the gland up by the extended approach is not highly recommended because most of the study, including Ami Kassam, who su suggested it in the past, the ischemia on that pituitary can cause severe hypopituitarism. So there are other techniques, and but we adapted the a technique where they call it, we go around the tumor rather than to dig inside the tumor, which is the subcapsular uh, approach or extracapsular approach. Few pitfalls you should avoid when you do a surgery at transfer either. In the old days, we used to put a patty on the, the, the herniated diaphragm, push that diaphragm up for the suction, and try to retrieve any residual tumor hiding behind or lateral to the diaph herniated diaphragm. And sometimes it's just hiding behind the pituitary stone. So now with the endoscopy, you can still lift the diaphragm, but you can see the, with the endoscopy, three areas I feel they are very essential, especially in microadenoma. Uh, the start, my practice with endoscopy on microadenoma, I said, what is the value? It has no value. It's a microadenoma less than, uh, one centimeter, but I realize uh, some uh, pushing disease, uh, they are very difficult. The medial wall of the cavernous sinus, the subdiaphragmatic area, especially near the la lateral recess, and behind the stone. These are the three areas that the endoscope give you inside and near vision and take that microadenoma properly up. So remember, it has a great value for these things. Uh, for the extended approach, uh, we, ha uh, we have to be careful with the hypophysial uh, trunk uh, artery. Chiasmal syndrome, I've seen only one case in my practice uh, of more than 35 years. I'm not sure in retrospect, this is a chiasmal syndrome. It might be, but Bottom line, the pathophysiology is ischemic answer to the nerve. Whether you do it by the surgery or by the lesion or by the herniation. The herniation, unless you have a very big tumor and herniate it down and angulate these vessels, is extremely rare. But I think most of it is traction injury that people, they pull on the capsule or on uh, some of these vessels unintentionally without counter dissections. And this is where they got some ischemia, whether it's a spasm or real uh, perforatory impact. Apoplexy is, for me, if presented with acute loss of vision or near loss, complete loss of vision, I don't like to wait when it's sizable. You see, our endocrinologists say, oh, we have cases that they have improved. Yes, for a small adenoma, yes. For a patient, medium size, but he has no clinical findings, Yes, but I don't wait on somebody who came through the emergency room that suddenly lost his vision almost complete. And this is one of the cases that patient immediately was taken to the OR with excellent visual outcome. So, and you see excellent removal. Uh, there are other indications for endoscopy. Now, the endoscopy it extended the approach for transfer. Right? This one case, by default, Everyone was talking about cordoma, and uh, the only thing was against cordoma was the wide base attachment. And by, but I was encouraged to go after it endoscopically because of the basal artery position. If you see the basal artery completely away from my feet, so I think I'm not going to lose anything. Go there, the compress the tumor, whatever it is, it will help me to facilitate if I want to go a second stage. And you see, it's a purely midline. This we managed, it's a meningioma, but it was very soft and was taken completely out without consequences. 
list of indication for the endoscopic stent approach other than pituitary, we have the rat cases, the craniopharyngioma, if it's purely cystic. I have hesitancy if it's a multi-compartmental and heavily calcified. I don't like to take the endoscopy unless you are doing minimal invasive, just cleaning the cyst. But I go, I'd like to take most of the capsule out and I'm in my hand, safer to go from above. And I will show a video on this one uh, shortly. Arachnoid and epidermoid cysts, they are a good indication. Cordoma, purely midline, is an excellent indication that we adopted in our practice. Subdiaphragmatic meningioma, they are the indication for this meningioma. I don't like to take the olfactory meningioma from there below because I feel you are doing a craniotomy from below. Like you have to take a margin, so you are exposing more and you communicate it with an infected area, although you put the flap and all these things. But I think I am better off in my hand to take a meningioma from above. But the sub I feel this is a potential indication because you are not causing trouble to this patient, whether it's the chiasm or the vessels. Let me see if I can show one or two videos. I'll, so I'm doing a typical terrional approach. I'll just move fast. We don't want to see all these. And I usually open the door basally rather than circumficially. And now you see the optic on the right side. This is the anterior fossa. This is the optic nerve. And I'm trying to peel the arachnoid from this lesion first. The two forceps techniques, something I learned from Professor Majid Sami, a fantastic technique for peeling the arachnoid. Now this is the optical carotid recess from the other side. I took that tumor from here. You can see the carotid under the left optic here. You see the heavy calcification. I just showed this video how the calcification can be very adherent. And it takes several techniques. Uh, it's a ball hook, ball dissector, heavy dissector, scissors. Peel and counter resistance. Sharp pouch of resection of calcification. Sometimes it's the only tool that can take this calcification. And you see when it comes here posteriorly, peeling the arachnoid, you see how it's adherent, but it's, you can peel it. And you can see on the media aspect, the vessels and the perforator. This is my concern of going from below on heavily calcified lesion. You see the perforators and you see the A1, very clearly uh, nice picture here. And this is the thrombose, uh, uh, sorry, a theroma and the basal tip artery. See? And you see how it's attached to this remnant of the capsule. This posterior cerebral artery, the basal tip is more here, hiding. And this is the last piece of calcification we'll take it out.
So I will show you the endoscope where I use it to see residual tumor. This is the carotid under the optic nerve. And this is the stalk. You see still calcification behind the stalk. Uh, so you know where you are and you can handle this one nicely eventually. So this is a, sorry for the, that. I'm sure we will have this story again. 62 years old, was having a craniopharyngioma with a visual problem treated in France, a transvenidal endoscopic surgery. I think they emptied the cyst and that was two and a half years ago and received post uh, decompression uh, radiation therapy there. He came to us with the progressive visual loss and with a lesion that I will show it to you by the video. He is in his 60s. This is the image. You see the calcification centrally located and posteriorly located. So I have the surgery and completed the section. I should not go from below because this might be so fragile. So, I, and with severe visual loss, I elected to go from top. We did the tabular approach again. This is small cotton aid with surgery cell. I learned this technique from Professor Yezajil as soft tissue retroactor. So, um, would give me to another one. I'm getting to the previous one. I don't want this one. Okay. I'm not coming to the one I want. Now I move to the other areas of interest, which are the actually the actual topic that merits of simple approach and rule of endoscopy. The two uh, power hops approaches of the retro sigmoid and the terrionic approach. We moved down over the past 20 years for all these subtemporal and tear petrosal retroal labyrinth, transcochlear and combined pre sigmoid approach and endoscopy. Now we are reversing back to the retro sigmoid supported with the hybrid use of endoscopy, and we did the same from terrional to bifrontal approach of frontal orbitozygomatic back to terrional and add the endoscopy as a hybrid. Uh, what I'm doing now, most of these cases and the one the case I showed you, I don't do the frontal orbitozygomatic in full load. That's what I'll do a typical terrional approach. The resection of the lateral swinging wing is the essential part of exposure of anterior and middle fossa. You have a near vision, and you take any bone back on knee, and it's a common practice for every neurosurgeon doing skull based surgery. And in some of these cases, I drill the optic foramina. This is an essential part when you are dealing with the clinoid meningioma, sorry, with the tuberculous cell meningioma or uh, supracellular meningioma. Because Manipulating of a tight tether optic nerve can lead to additional ischemia. And my result in my first 15 years of practice doing this at the end of the procedure has not yielded improvement of the optic outcome. But doing it ahead of time, especially in tuberculum cell meningioma, you can mobilize that nerve. It takes you only a few minutes and then you can manipulate the optic nerve much easier without having against the dual uh, wing. And uh, this has been recommended actually by Sujita. And this is actually uh, the picture you will see. And arachnoid is very important part for you to protect the old neurovascular structure. We have designed something called the five the technique where you drill the sonoid wing to the roof, the optic nerve, then start at the base devascularizing the uh, meningioma from the planum solidale or tuberculum cellulite, reduce the amount of bleeding, and then it makes the central debulking, and then finally the dissection, keeping the arachnoid, which I mentioned here, it's your friend, is the natural patty. We have published more than 20 years ago the eyebrow incision, we have adapted from Berlinski, 
and we did several cases, about 18 cases at that time, and some of them, they were a younger age group, or elderly that they were bald and they don't like to have an incision in their frontal area or a hairline, there is no hairline. Uh, but we modified a little bit, we don't do a supraorbital uh, craniotomy, we did a mini orbitozygomatic. Actually, only the root of the zygoma was removed with the spheroid wing, and it gave us the functional exposure that we need the one and a half centimeter in width and three centimeter in depth. And this is uh, the line of incision. So the fascia, the root of the zygoma, we do a one ball hole and then we cut this flap. And this is what you see. You can see the tumor. You can see the optic nerve. On the right side, you see the stalk. And this is the contralateral optic nerve after the resection of the lesion. So this is a lesion before and this is after. This approach is interesting, but slowly we went back to the simple Teriona approach. Uh, should I attempt another video? Perhaps we were lucky. You don't see it, huh? Yeah, we see it. It's playing well. All right. This is a small, but it's more left side. She presented with left side is visual loss. I'm going from the right side, intentionally. This is a non-dominant. I'm opening the sylvian cistern down to the proximally. I like to use this curved needle as my best tool as a sharp instrument. Sometimes I use the micro scissor. Once I open, I cut. Now I have exposed the optic nerve is here and on the right side. And I'm drilling the contralateral optic nerve for I mean, from the top and the planum, uh, the tuberculum cell area planum. This is the midline. I'm going to the other side. Going to the optic area, optic foramina. More. Devascularize the tumor from its base. Here, when you are do this, important to use the Doppler to make sure you are not injuring the carotid under the left optic. Now we devascularize the tumor, we're pushing the tumor posteriorly. And I found the gap to the carotid, most probably, yes. Now this tumor can be peeled. We peel the arachnoid, the technique I mentioned, is very important. This, it save you any vascular injuries to perforator or to major vessels. I will start peeling it from the left side to the right side. And after you devascularize, it will be not a vascular tumor. It will be very easy to take it out. You can see the optic nerve on the left side here. And that tumor can be peeled and taken out completely. Now I will put the endoscope shortly. This is the car carotid under the left optic, you see the intact arachnoid with the perforator. Endoscopic view. Carotid, and you see the perforator. This is the beauty of that technique from above, maintaining the arachnoid as possible. And you see there are some bigger vessels for still communicating. This is the third nerve on the other side, covered with the arachnid. Uh, okay. Of course, when you enjoy the picture, you keep the endoscope, the same picture, we start looking and show the resident for everything. 
there was a small component here to suck it out. And pulsating prepontine system as well. Optic nip on the right side. Yeah. This is post op complete resection without lens. And she has the immediately a very good recovery of her vision. The actually the left optic nerve was not touched at all. This is the beauty. Now we go back to the uh, presentation. Okay. The other areas that we, we moved in is the nickel scape and the tumor going in the CP angle and extending to the nickel cave. We used to do the combined approach, a fantastic approach designed by uh, or popularized by Hakuba. We divide usually uh, lesion in that area, uh, in the petroclival, superior petroclival and mechanical scape. Different approaches, you can approach them frontal orbital zygomatic, like uh, the typical from Dolens, going posterior cavernous, you can do the Kawazi approach, with the subtemporal, and you can do the combined approach with the Hakuba, subtemporal, anterior, and posterior petrosa. But if, it gives you a wide exposure, fantastic, but that procedure is a time consuming. You are doing a simple mastectomy, you are doing a retro mastectomy, you are doing subtemporal craniotomy, and combine them together over the lateral sinus and pre sigmoid sinus, and then you drill the pre sigmoid area to find a good space. This is the Hakuba. Uh, Kawazi is looking to his field. His first time approach was a mid basal artery aneurysm, not for mass lesion, but eventually he expedited to some meningiomas and schwannomas in trigeminal and schwannoma in this area. This is the typical Hakuba. This is a publication from Anufti with the last drawing that shows you. And this is what we do the uh, bo multiple borehole over the sinus and take a simple. Uh, mastectomy, I learned the technique too, from Fukushima. And this is the pre sigmoid uh, area that you like the triangle of uh, Truman. You need to drill it to find the space and you incise the dura pre sigmoid area and you are anteriorly to the cranial lens rather than posteriorly. It has advantages, but you spend the whole day in the OR doing the drilling. The Approach we adapted in some of these cases. This is actually was published before by Majid Sami and his team, uh, which they call it the supramiatal approach to make scape. You go there and you might incise or drill the apex of that bone of the petrus, or you incise the dura, the tentorium from below, and that's what we do. Uh, so you have access to these. Areas. Uh, this is the position I like to use. I don't like the sitting position. I give sitting position in general. I keep it for some indication like pineal region. But this is the, the position that give me almost a semi-sitting position. If I elevate the trunk within the modern tables, you can elevate the trunk or you can bring it down. You can flip it forward and backwards. And this is one of the meningioma you took. And then you see, we are seeing the third nerve already and the ambient system. So it gives you a higher access, uh, which is you needed without the need to go on the subtemporal area. After all, I don't like the subtemporal approach on the left side. I'm worried about the vein of labia and function of the vein. These are some of the cases we took it this way. This, we were planning to do pre-sigmoid approach because it has a good component, 50-50 above and 50 down. But when I look to the uh, images on an actual view, you see what's the sigma, uh, the uh, lateral sinus is very engorged and uh, very big. And there is no space, uh, I mean, in front of the sigmoid, no space uh, to go there to initiate a Brutman triangle and go pre sigmoid. So I elected to go from the back, and that's what we did. And this is the post resection. Uh, nice view without any changes on the cerebral node. These are other cases. We did several of these petro uh, or uh, petros apex meningioma that goes up and down along the tentorium. 
with the same technique described by Professor Sam. And this is another case, pre, as you see it here. It's actually, this is the tent and it goes high up. But as long as you can reach, you can take this part and you can retrieve this one and visualize it nicely with the endoscopy. This is post resection. So I will show here a case for a patient with a trigeminal neuralgia, again with the same technique, high up to the petrus and taken out without any consequences. Another indication for this, uh, the epidermoid. The epidermoid uh, can grow anywhere, follow the system and uh, go around the vessels. That's why we call that sign the hanging vessels phenomena. And that's what you see under the microscope. And I will have to show you another video, sorry, the playing. Uh, yeah, he showed me the other video. Okay, this is pre-op. We do the small incision at the base of the retromastoid area to relieve CSF from the cisterna magna. This is a technique prescribed by Professor Yazajil, and you do it before you open the dura. So if you have a large lesion, it won't have any aid on you, the cerebellum. This is the cisterna, take a needle and we make a small incision. And then you release the pressure and then you can open the dura nicer. Open it in this technique mode. And it's a little bit uh, thickened supermeatal area. Might you drill a little bit, I think that's what it is. And you see the tumor underneath here, and there is a nerve on the side. Might drill a little bit of this. And after doing the drilling, we start taking the arachnoid and you see. CP angle system, uh, the two forceps technique with a lot of irrigation and ball dissector. I like to use it. It's not harsh on the vessels or on the nerve. Uh, some vessels in the depth. This is what I call the chopsticks technique. We use the two forceps or a suction and a ball dissector. This is the facial vestibular nerve and cochlear nerve complex. They are doing left sided, shelling the tumor slowly, piecemealy. See, sometimes they are very adherent, so soft. Take the arachnoid that belongs to the patient. And if you take the arachnoid, the vessel goes away with it. Never take the arachnoid with this lesion because you ask for trouble. see some of the perforators. See how adherent to the vessel, but they are dissectable. Again, arachnoid, this is the trick. So piecemeal removal.
and you start seeing the brain stem and the depth. Now this is the trigeminal nerve. I shift a little bit. This is the brain stem. See how it was pushed. This is the motor trigeminal nerve. This is the sensory. Try to show this one to the residents. And now I tilt the scope to see the system for the, if you open this system, you are seeing, you will see the basal artery. And this is the seven, eight. And you can see the trace of the these are the cardiac cranial nerve. It's the sixth nerve up. We put the endoscope to see the this is again the trigeminal, see the vessels. It gives you a fantastic near view, and you make sure whether they have any residual or not. And you can take it. Directly, I felt there was a small, tiny residual up, so I will put the scope to retrieve it uh, or take the microscope. This is six net. Yeah, I'm using a dynamic. Uh, I don't have a good holder, diplomatic. I don't like it, the one I have. Well, I'm the process to purchase a new one. But nothing. Uh, beat the near vision of the endoscopy and the visualization. And this is the caudocrine nerve still covered with the arachnid and you see no retraction on any of these important vessels. I want to show one other video. Yeah, this one we did the suboccipital uh, to go in a semi-sitting position for a pinear vision tumor. It's a pinear vision. This is the approach of the regular, and you see with the endoscopy, the different in the view. You see on the right, you see on the left. Fantastic view with the endoscopy. Here, the depth absorbs some of the light. Endoscopy gives you light and panoramic view. This is still under microscope. Now we put the endoscope. See, we are at the back of the third ventricle, the massa intermedia. This is the, uh, the posterior commissure is here, thalamus there, choroid plexus within in both sides, furnace. Okay, this is the posterior third. The view is fantastic when you have the endoscope, but we will go to the purpose where we are, see how much you can go forwards as well. Follow the furnace all the way, follow the monroe. That was our first use of endoscopy in pineal vision. It was very exciting for all the people in the room. That's why everyone, I think there were more than 10 people attending to see. And now we start getting this tumor out under the endoscopic. I wish I have a good holder so I can use a two hand, but I'm using a dynamic technique. That's why I'm using two hand, the endoscope in the other hand. Uh, I could have asked somebody, but the space is tight to have four hands there. And if you want to take this one with the regular microscopic surgery, you have to incise the anterior part of the vermis and or push on the vermis, you might lacerate the vein. You see, you can take a good amount of this tumor under the endoscopy. And getting even a nice view still look very good. The beauty of the endoscopy it can give you a lateral view as well to the lateral part. Most of the supercellular midline 
it does not give you the lateral component. And here you can. You have to be careful, of course, the sixth nerve uh, and the fourth nerve. So the fourth nerve uh, involvement. Okay, go back to the presentation. My last slide, as a human nature, as I said, affinity to novelty, innovation, and to overcome challenges and complexity. But in my recent years of practice, I moved to understand the wabi-sabi concept. But perhaps our colleague from Japan, he can appreciate that statement for people they don't know the wabi-sabi is simplicity, and appreciation of imperfection to make it better. Because we're always keen to lay the last piece of tumors that uh, we are struggling with to show, demonstrate our ego that I remove things completely and we end with catastrophe. So balance yourself and remember this expression. I thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Imad Kanan, for this wonderful presentation. Those were excellent videos you showed of the hybrid use of endoscopy. May I please invite uh, the Chair, Professor Alberto Felitti, to say his expert comments. Alberto? Yes. Thank you, Raja. Thank you, Professor Kana, for Thank this you. very interesting and inspiring presentation. Uh, well, I think we, we all agree about the fact that advances in endoscopic and microsurgical strategies have really revolutionized the treatment of skull-based pathologies. And the lecture today uh, showed us how much potential we have nowadays in combining microsurgery with endoscopy. So actually this lecture um, gives the possibility for a number of comments and questions. So I will try to limit myself to uh, the main ones and then maybe open the discussion uh, among the other colleagues. Uh, so about transphenoidal uh, surgery, Professor. Um, well, I, I use uh, endoscope alone. I don't use microscope. Uh, but uh, besides the approach, uh, I, I completely agree and I do the same uh, movements and technique you use. I have uh, some questions. Um, what do you think about the forehand technique? Uh, do you uh, use this technique uh, yes. in selected cases um, or do you prefer to perform surgery just by yourself? This is one question. Another question um, is about uh, uh, endoscope holder. So do you use for transphenoidal surgery a holder or do you use a freehand technique? For me, the questions, the first question, we use the forehand technique. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should be handicapped with one hand. Uh, you are not doing a good job. It's two hands, like I said, I am a microsurgeon. I want to do microsurgery under the endoscopic visualization. I look to the endoscope as a vis visualization tool that give me a wide view and a nice light and near vision. These are the three things that is of a great value of the endoscopy. But I don't want to be in handicapped using one hand. So we do binostri and that if you see, we put the endoscope on the other side and sometimes we shift, we switch. I put the assistant on the left and I go for right. It depends the direction of the lesion. This is uh, the question for first one. Holder for the translator? No, I don't use the holder because I want to use uh, my two hands. The holder is sometimes ba a barrier in your hand. It's a dynamic view and the depth, you are not going to change to keep going in and out with the holder. Especially if you are using pneumatic, you know this pneumatic, uh, the old one I have, this is what uh, uh, the people in uh, Germany used to have it, uh, pneumatic, I think it's coming from Metaka, I'm not sure. But now they are new in the market that there is a pneumatic only at the level of the endoscope itself, the rest is a rigid holder, like uh, uh, the regular uh, retractors of the brain. 
This one I don't have, and I was in discussion with uh, Henry Schroeder, you might know him. He's a great endoscopic surgeon, and he used this technique, but I don't use a fixed holder for the pituitary. Uh, this is the original description, actually. Uh, what his name, the Korean guy from Pittsburgh, he used to put the fixed holder to start with. Now, I use the procedure and the exposure, whatever I need, I do it myself. I was trained because I, in the past, have worked with some EMT colleagues, so I know the tricks and bits. But now my assistant learned the technique from me, and he can be a very cool pilot to drive the endoscope nicely. Without the co-pilot, you will be a lousy driver alone. So it's always good to have the co-pilot trained how and to come to the right area at the right moment. Because if the dynamic is not at the right area right then, and block you and your practice, it will be very difficult to do the proper resection. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and I also would like to point out, uh, especially for young neurosurgeons, the importance of uh, collaboration with ENT uh, colleagues. Uh, of course, uh, when you are a very expert and a master uh, surgeon for transphenoidal, uh, maybe you, you don't need, but in my experience, I found very useful to operate with ENT uh, doctors uh, because they know the anatomy of that region uh, uh, better than actually we do, at least uh, initially at the initial part of our career. So I have a few other questions, uh, Professor. Uh, you showed uh, some nice cases of uh, uh, dumbbell-shaped adenomas. So uh, in, in some cases, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the tissue of the, of the tumor is uh, very uh, soft and uh, melty, and it's quite easy to uh, remove completely the tumor from, uh, uh, from down. Uh, because uh, basically the tumor uh, falls down towards you. But sometimes uh, the consistency of this tumor is more stiff. So do you have any trick, any advice to be able to completely remove these tumors? Also, uh, the, the part which is uh, uh, over the di diaphragm. I mentioned in one of the slides, some of the tricks has been practiced by all... Uh... Uh, I said the avant-garde neurosurgeon, myself, and even the future. I like doing the PEEP, which is increase the intracranial uh, CSF pressure. The Valsava maneuver is an essential component sometimes of this procedure. It will help you to, to push it slowly down. Uh, some people, they do the jugular compression on both sides. Uh, it was mentioned uh, recently by Bill uh, Caldwell from Salt Lake. He learned it from Ed Laws, one of the pioneers pituitary surgeon. I don't like the jugular, but I'll ask the anesthesia to do the valsava, valsava maneuver. Going extra capsular, it gives you a better chance to take a solid tumor than the inter. Because when you go within the tumor, you start having the ooze and you start, I don't like to use the punch within the supercellular area. You never know what is inside this punch unless you have the endoscope to the tip and you see what you are punching it. Even that, you don't know whether there is a vessel behind it that you punch. I like to dissect first mm -hmm. and then put it. And the most important, I mentioned it, even in technical practice for microsurgery, the pull and counter. So you use two techniques. One is counter. If you keep pulling, you pull on vessel, you pull on optic chiasm on this vessel, and you cause trouble, traction injuries. If you put the counter, then you dissect and respect the arachnoid. If you see arachnoid, try in one way or other to put a patty on it and push it away because you save yourself trouble from injuring the vessel or neural structure. Thank you. And um... When, when you use actually both techniques uh, uh, for skull-based surgery, so you are performing an open uh, microsurgical approach, uh, and then you uh, switch to endoscope. Uh, of course, uh, in my experience, uh, the endoscope uh, allows you to have a direct and clear vision also 
of hidden corners of the field, which microsurgery uh, cannot give you. But can you please tell us how difficult it is to not only, not just uh, visualize with the endoscope, but to manipulate the structures uh, in these hidden corners? Because uh, uh, with one hand you are uh, using the endoscope and you are looking at a hidden corner, but if you, if you find a remnant of a tumor, how difficult it is to actually uh, do something uh, operatively under the endoscopic vision. Yeah, this is a, very simply, if you have, in that case, you need the holder because in the depth, you don't trust, can, uh, with respect to my co-partner, I don't trust anybody when I'm dealing with the small perforators in the depth or cranial nerve or brainstem, because any sudden motion can cause catastrophic results. And that's why I feel the, the rigid uh, hold, I mean the holder, a good holder will be a value for these areas. Sometimes I call it the visual rehearsal. Visual rehearsal, we all practice it with subconscious. I learned about that expression two years ago when I read uh, about a book about innovation. When you have a surgery tomorrow, with your subconscious, you dream about it. You dream about potential complication. You wake up and say, I've seen that complication I treated during my dream. This is the rehearsal you have to plan your case and to overcome trouble. One of them, the visual rehearsal that I might not see the tumor in that corner. I need the endoscope. I need to have a rigid comp uh, I mean, holder to see that corner because the microscope, I agree 100% <clears> with <throat> you, that there are some areas you think you took it completely. Fortunately, there was another better uh, 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 video on the epidermoid where I felt I took everything out, but I put the endoscope and I start seeing that there are still residual tumor and I did it, but I was handicapped because I didn't have the good holder. I trusted only myself to hold the one scope one hand and I used it. This case can be dissected with a dissector. I put the probe under the, opti the facial nerve and I took retrieve some of the residual. This is very important. But I think you need a holder when you are doing things combined in these tricky cases. Yeah. And uh, about craniopharyngiomas, uh, so you also showed uh, uh, interesting cases of craniopharyngioma. Uh, in general, uh, irrespective of uh, the approach, uh, transphenoidal or open microsurgical, um, how, how often do you uh, attempt a radical resection or how often uh, do you feel subtotal resection uh, uh, is enough? Uh, you know, there are some colleagues. Yeah, this is a big dilemma. It has been over the years. Problem, right? So uh, how, how do you feel we should behave in okay. such And also, as you talked about uh, endoscope, uh, you know, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, the cystic component of the craniopharyngioma is uh, uh, dominant. And I have memory of two cases, uh, um, elderly patients, of course, uh, we treated only by fenestration of this huge cystic component uh, from a transventricular uh, puncture. Uh, so this is another uh, case, maybe not so frequent, where you can use only endoscope to treat uh, such a pathology. Of course, uh, you don't uh, have a total resection, but probably we should uh, focus more on the quality of life of our patients. So how, how do you feel about this problem? Of course, craniopharyngioma history goes uh, long back. And I remember uh, the pioneer uh, microsurgeons, uh, Professor Yesaji, who has a, a large series of craniopharyngioma, he used to say, you take it complete. You go to the OR with the intention not to do a partial job, but to go for a complete resection between two packets whenever it's feasible, uh, not on the cost of the quality of life of a human being, especially people dealing with pediatric. You see, they remove a tumor completely out and patient end with a hypothalamic disturbance 
obesity and just name it the I for their whole life. And with this even, he used to say, Professor Yazar Jail, I don't have recurrence because I did the complete resection. Over the years, when he moved from Zurich to Little Rock and now he's in Turkey, he said, just wait and see for your recurrence. If it's not coming in a few years, it comes after 30 years. So craniopharyngioma is a benign disease by histology, but ugly by the potential recurrence. Now, all the methods, so how I deal with myself, I look for the how much morbidity this patient have, and uh, uh, age is important, if it's in the, like this case of 62 or 65, but uh, I take it into consideration, but I go always with the intention and planning to remove it completely if it's a feasible. If I see adherent and that I will cause trouble, I have to leave something behind. And there is no, I am not shy from saying I left something behind rather than have a patient say that guy, doctor gave me a morbidity for my lifetime. You see, this is very important. This should be taken in consideration. Mindfulness uh, is an emotional intelligence between you and the patient is very essential in the practice, especially in these cases. It's not a malignant tumor that you can take a biopsy and uh, leave it for the others, radiation and chemo. Because the ideal treatment is still surgical. Cyst drainage, it might work, but it's not long. That case I, uh, I took for the surgery, I showed you the video. It's less than two years that he recurred with severe visual loss because he has a solid component as well as producing. Okay? And they have tried the pliomycin. I remember Mauricio, my friend, the pediatric neurosurgeons. He said it did not work the way it is supposed to. There are people still coming back and say pliomycin will do a minimum invasive aspiration and put pliomycin, it will shrink. There are doubt about the result of this one. And some of them, the interferon, if it leaks out, it might cause a major inflammatory process and other reaction to the optic apparatus and the vessels, vessels mass. So it will end complication because you try to be minimal invasive on the wrong spot. So I go for the intention to go in with maximum removal. Uh, endoscopy is a fantastic for a midline purely cystic lesion, but try to remove the cyst wall if it's not adherent. In typical situation, the dome of that cyst usually is not that adherent, but the problem is the lateral wall to the hypothalamus. This is the one you have to respect by peel and counteract because peeling alone is a traction injury to the hypothalamus. Counter is this. The other issue is the pituitary stroke. From going above in the recent cases now and in the endoscope and looking, we could have saved the pituitary stroke tremendously, but they will end having some you are in the, uh, I mean, endocrine disturbance. Uh, sometimes whether it's the vascularity, whether the manipulation, it's physically there, but the function is not. Uh, Professor uh, Edlows and Professor Yashagi used to propose, if you want to cure, you might need to section the stalk. And if you want to section the stalk, section it distally because the secretory granules, they might still be product, producing to compensate for the DI. But that tumor does not respect what you are saying because the tumor sometimes attached to the proximal part of the stalk. You cannot section it at the distal and they still have a tumor. But I don't like to do intentionally the section of the stalk. I like to dissect the tumor or I leave something on it. This is my practice. Again, important nowadays, if you ask any patient, the problem, some people, they put the burden on the patient to make a decision. Patient, how he is going to make a decision? He's not a doctor. He need guidance. But they're giving the information, you want me to section the stalk or not? If I section the stalk, you will be on the eye. 
if I don't do it, you might have the cancer. This is, I call it defensive medicine, which is a wrong practice. You have to guide the patient to the best for his case. You are the doctor. And in this case, I will tell him that I'm not going to section the stock to avoid permanent DI, hypothalamic disturbance, but there are a risk of potential risk of recurrence and we have to take it in consideration. Now, radiation therapy, again, is a big issue. Some reports, they said fantastic control of the lesion. Some of them, they got problem with the radiation effect. But if you want to give radiation, give stereotactic fraction. Don't give what they used to give in the past, uh, the full dose of radiation. That's my approach to this one. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Raja, I think uh, we can yeah. open the discussion to other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Professor. Now, I think uh, we, we can open this platform for discussion. May I please call upon Liu? Liu, would you like to ask something? Hello, Prof. Uh, thanks for your nice presentation. Uh, I have two questions here, Prof. Uh, in skull-based uh, approach, uh, skull-based lesion microscopically, uh, with a small dura opening, sometimes when we want to look at angles and adapt, uh, the illumination from the microscope may not be sufficient for us to do a proper job. Have you ever, at that time, used endoscopic light to assist you in your surgery? This was my first question. Okay, should I go ahead with the answer of this one? Yes, yes. The small dura opening, that's what I call it, the functional opening. You don't need, some people, they expose half of the brain to look to this one centimeter by three centimeter. Mm -hmm. These cases, it's not epilepsy surgery. You don't want to have a grid. Even nowadays, epilepsy, you put the grid under the dura and you can evaluate. But this is not epilepsy surgery. This is the functional exposure. Now, I do this incision along the base and I'm making a decompressive incision vertical to it, one and a half, or one and a half centimeter parallel to the sylvian fissure so there won't be any tightness. Once you are in the skull base, the name of the game to release CSF from the basal system. Because yes. if you don't release CSF, you will have problem with having herniated frontal lobe if you are putting retraction. And retraction is the enemy of neurosurgeon yes. and the enemy of the brain. Minimal retraction. If you notice, I put that small cotonoid at the base and took the retractor out. I was working mm -hmm. without the retractor because I relieved the CSF from the sylvian system and sometimes even the Lilyquist membrane, I incise it without opening widely uh, mm -hmm. laterally. I open where I need to open. This is the approach I will use. Uh, the endoscopic light, there is another light. Either you use the endoscope or not. I don't use the endoscope for the light. I use the endoscope as a visualization. I want to see the corner I'm not seeing with the microscope rather than put light. There is something uh, we actually, we purchased it three years ago. It was again Pop Spetzler who introduced it, that you have a halogen light, you put it next to your uh, equipment so you can see nicely in the depth if you are dealing with, the, especially on cavernoma of the brain stem. This is a nice tool. It's a, it's a light, but not to put the endoscope as a light purely. It will be for the function of it, which is visualization. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. One more question, uh, Prof. Uh, for, to look for a remnant uh, of the lesion tumor, you put in an endoscope. My question is, uh, are you uh, using an endoscopic assisted technique where you use an uh, angled instrument to remove the remnant uh, or you use pure endoscopic technique? You are talking about transcranial or transcranial? Yeah. At any transcranial microscopically, but uh, you use endoscope to check around the corner, and and let's say you found a remnant, uh, would you use a microscopic instrument, an angle microscopic instrument to remove the remnant, uh, uh, as yes. you call as uh, assisted endoscopic yeah. technique, or yeah, pure we use endoscopic a, in the you use? Yeah. Yeah. We use the thirty degree, the forty five degree endoscope for corners. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now we use an angled equipment, of course. We mm -hmm. need to go use the angle, angle suction mm -hmm. in the different direction, upward, downwards. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, nice tools they were designed by many people, actually. They were taking tools that they go in any angle 
-hmm. and in different corners. Mm -hmm. So you rotate them like a revolver. Mm -hmm. Even for example, the, the carison I'm using, it's a fantastic carison because I can rotate it. I need one carison to rotate mm -hmm. to any from 12 to six o'clock. Mm -hmm. We right. use angle equipment as well. Okay. Thank you, Officer Kimura. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, Professor Kamal. Yeah, very nice, excellent uh, presentation. I was so surprised and so. I, I have one question for you. So, sometimes, so giant, huge pituitary adenoma. If you, uh, if you plan to perform the stage, the two stage surgery for the giant pituitary tumor, uh, once you to remove the uh, partial resection for the pituitary adenoma. So sometimes post-operative bleeding may occur. So for the next, so for the next surgery too, you should you should avoid the post-operative bleeding. So how to manage the to control the bleeding? Because you you remove the so large pituitary adenoma successfully, elegantly. So this is my question. I think the second case I showed was a two-stage procedure. Yeah, this is what I told you. I have one case in my practice. I always show it to the complication webinars. Mm -hmm. uh, Keki Tumil asked me one time uh, for the meeting. And uh, w nobody reporting this. But eventually, when, when I present my case, that is the time before we have interoperative MRI. And that time, they, we did not have uh, tools to reach uh, the supracellular area tremendously for the endoscope. So, I took that tumor and I felt it was, uh, he was 26 years old. And I took that tumor and I thought I removed most of it. And I hope that if there is a residue and this is what we used to do, let's wait and see. And we get the CT scan the day after. And then we'll see if there is a residue, we decide whether if it did not descend, we'll go from above. Yeah. That patient uh, did not wake up from the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, 30 minutes after the surgery, my young fellow came to me and said, the patient is not waking up. So we shifted him to the CT scan. And we saw apoplexy of the residual tumor up. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this apoplexy has led, it was not by itself the problem. It has led to obliteration of the phenomena of mono bilaterally leading to acute hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. And the acute hydrocephalus, he was on the measure of herniation. So we rushed him to the OR. He was still under anesthesia, put in EVD, and then uh, I borrowed the uroscope <laughs> because every microscope was in use from the pediatric department. Oh. And I tried to take some of the blood from above, but I put the drain. But Mm -hmm. He did not recover tremendously well. I think the herniation caused him the hypothalamic disturbance that his cognitive function was not very good. He was able to be up and around. His vision improved, but his line of communication was very limited. Unfortunately, we did not yeah. do well with this case. But nowadays, Putting the endoscope, you see how much residual you have. You try to take as much you can. As much as possible. Yeah. And yeah. some of people, uh, like uh, I know from Bill Caldwell, he said he always think whether he should go from above first stage and come from below. So we learn typically from the last experience. You got mm -hmm. in trouble in the last case. You did it this way. You move to the other alternative. Mm -hmm. But nowadays with the endoscopy, I'm privileged to have an intraoperative MRI. When I know there is a big tumor, I won't be able to take completely uh, with confidence. I start, I still, my approach, transferring the surgery as long as it's a midline, whatever the size. And I'll go in, and as long as I'm seeing a tumor with the endoscope, I will continue until I see that I'm almost at the top of it. Or I have landmark tells me in that tumor component on the MRI, there is a cyst that I reach it, that it give me hint, then I drain that cyst. So 
this is the one only one case I have in my mm. practice, so I mm. cannot make too much about. It. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so yeah. I just I totally agree with your concept of the wabi sabi concept as one of the Japanese neurosurgeons. So <laughs> very nice. You have, you have to give me. a session. I on understand it. about the uh, yeah nuance or oh, surgical nuance. I can understand. Yeah, very nice concept. So scalable surgery is going towards the simplicity, as you mentioned in your presentation. Uh, front lateral or retro sigmoid, sometimes using a supra miniature approach combined use. So, but the simplicity is very nice to uh, very nice trends for the uh, scalable surgery in the current situation. Thank you for your presentation. Sachin would like to come in. Yes, sir. sir. Yes. Good evening, sir. That was a nice presentation. Uh, good picture of the cases and uh, good overview of uh, endoscopic and uh, scalable surgery. I have one question. So, uh, in most of the cases, you've been using the endoscope to see for the hidden pockets of the tumor, if there are any or not. But if at all, if you're going for complete radical excision and if there is a choice of doing the intraoperative MRI, or do you prefer to still do an intraoperative MRI for, the, for any other uh, remnant of the tumor, or do you rely completely on the endoscope? Because sometimes with the endoscope, the field is a little messy, blurred. Sometimes the tumor is invading in the brain parenchyma. You may not be able to distinguish correctly whether there is a tumor tissue or the brain tissue. So, do you think the endoscope intraoperatively is gold standard, or still intraoperative MRI can still have some scope? One thing, and just out of the curiosity, that pituitary, the pineal region tumor case you showed, the suprasebral intratentorial approach. What was the histopathology in that case? What did it turn out to be, sir? Uh, Okay. Okay. That's why I went aggressive because it was not the other one that it can be amenable for radiation therapy. Yes. yes so now, only one answer, thing I noted in that case was generally for suprasurbital infratentorial approach, we get a very wide exposure. We do a little larger suboccipital craniotomy that little more wider than what is the ordinary. Yeah. But your your exposure was still limited, and you were able to do a nice uh, tumor excision. We in that case we have anomaly of the lateral sinus on the left side that it deprive us from going splitting the sinus, and I didn't want to do it. That's why, if you notice, the dual exposure from the posterior fossa was not tremendous, only the upper part. But I think this is what triggered me to use the endoscope, and this you see we found an indication for it. Now, to answer your question about the operative MRI, it's a matter of cost effectiveness. This is the argument, because um, our friend, uh, I pay uh, Sherry, I'm from, uh, he's from Indian, but he was back in Nepal. He got the intraoperative, said, this is the last time he would purchase another <laughs> intraoperative uh, MRI. It has its value, uh, but there is a learning curve, number one. The other thing, you need to have a team. If you don't have a radiology technician that he will come and do it, and each time you will be under the mercy of radiology department to send to somebody, and you have to wait, you are losing or have time for other colleagues or from your own time. So uh, a smooth flow is very essential. Now, endoscopy has taken a major bulk of this uh, situation, but there are cases, as you said, when the area is not clear, you are not 100% sure you are still in the middle of tumor, but you are not seeing and you are worried about the next boundary. These are where the indication is there. If you have the facilities, uh, you are in doubt, make use of the facility because this facility costs millions and you have to justify it. The other things, unfortunately, my institution did not allow us to use it for outpatient services. So this is dedicated intraoperative MRI for that room. So you cannot, and uh, on a weekend or on a after hours, use it for outpatients area. This is the standard for infection control. They make it very strict. It would be dedicated only for intraoperative. But what we have done to make worth the money, if we have not used it intraoperatively, I am confident or almost confident of the resection. I don't know how much residual left. I still do post-op immediately MRI. So I save the patient another visit to the MRI the day after or three days. So this will expedite and make use of the facilities properly. And with the learning, 
with the new system, I think it takes less than 20 minutes between the cases to do these things. We had a very detailed discussion about endoscopy and hybrid endoscopy from very knowledgeable chair and the speaker. Uh, with that, I think we can conclude our this session. So, uh, on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Prof. Yoko Kato, I would like to thank Prof. Imad Kannan for coming here to this online platform of ACNS webinar and giving us this illuminating lecture about hybrid use of endoscopy. And the Chair, Prof. Alberto Felitti, for chairing this session and giving his expert comments. This was the last talk of this month of uh, ACNS webinars. We'll be starting a fresh edition of uh, September webinars from the 2nd of September. So until uh, next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you everybody for joining.